Okay. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the class today. Let's pray and uh, we'll get started. Could uh, one of us please uh, lead the class in prayer? Anybody could pray and we'll start. Can I go ahead and pray? Sir? Yes, please. Thank you. Father, we thank you for your wonderful grace and your mercy over our lives, Lord Jesus. Uh, we submit this time into your hands, even as we continue to learn from the book of Romans. Father, Holy Spirit, come and uh, help us understand your word, Father. Uh, open our eyes, Jesus, to the hidden things of your word, Lord. I submit the rest of the time into your hands. You lead us and guide us, Father, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you. All right. So... We uh, covered Romans 9, 10, 11. Uh, these were, or I should say, these are these three chapters, 9, 10, 11, um, are um, somewhat difficult chapters in Paul's epistle to the Romans. And um, we went through that. We understood you know the conclusion paul comes to essentially at the end of chapter towards the end of chapter 11 is um god has not stopped working with the jewish people the people of israel uh, at this moment uh he has or he is working among the gentiles like it says there and um, uh, Romans eleven twenty five, 25, uh, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, Romans eleven twenty five. So, you know, God is just working among the non-Jewish world, getting people in until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And then he's going to, again, once again, pay attention to those people, the Jewish people, the people of Israel, get them grafted in or back in to um, they are the main olive tree. Uh, we are branches from the wild olive, the way they Paul uh, pictures this uh, in uh, Romans 11. And so he's going to you know, bring us all back together. And, uh, and ultimately, Paul, you know, he sums up by saying in verse Romans 11, 29, the gifts and the calling of God are unchangeable. That means God doesn't change his mind. Uh, about whom he chooses and whom he calls. So he hasn't changed his mind about Israel or the Jewish people. So his plans for them still holds good. Uh, and um, it's just that at this point, God is doing something uh, which he actually did speak to them in the very beginning. You know, when he called Abraham, he said, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So it's not that he didn't plan to do it. He already had it in the very beginning when he spoke, saying, you know, through you, I'll bless all the nations. And that's what he's doing. Just that they didn't understand it uh, at that time and uh, probably still don't understand, you know, uh, that God has actually worked through that nation, the nation of Israel, and is blessing the nations of the world and bringing the nations of the world back to himself. And then he's going to refocus or pay attention again to Israel. And so Paul sums up Romans 11 by just saying, you know, how great is God's ways of working, uh, his wisdom and knowledge, it's unsearchable. His ways are beyond even our understanding. So he closes out Romans 11 that way. Now, having gone on this journey uh, to describe what God is doing with the people of Israel, or the Jewish people. Now, Paul turns his attention back to the church at Rome, or the believers, or of course, we could say to the church itself, because whatever he's writing there is also for us. So he gets back to talking to believers. So it's now connecting back to Romans chapter eight, because still Romans eight, he was dealing with the believer, um, talking about how you live your Christian life, um, walking in the spirit, uh, crucifying the flesh, uh, rejoicing even through 
tribulations that we may face now, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. That's Romans 8. Then 9, 10, 11, he's gone on this little excursion. 12 picks up from where Romans 8 ended, which is, okay, let's talk to the believer and continue talking about how to live as believers, the Christian life, right? So that's Romans chapter 12. We get back to that, right? So um, this is, you know, uh, a very, very familiar chapter, Romans 12. Uh, many of us may have already preached uh, sermons and messages and, you know, things uh, from Romans 12, used it in our own personal lives, uh, shared it with other people, because it's, um, it's just really talking about things uh, we need as believers and how to live the Christian life. So it's, it's a very well-known passage, uh, well-known chapter. So let's just read the whole chapter and then we will start bringing, uh, we'll uh, focus in on, 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 on uh, you know, uh, individual verses. So Romans 12, we're going to read the whole chapter, which is uh, pretty short, just 21 verses. So maybe each, each one of us could read about four verses. Uh, Romans 12, uh, each can read four verses, please. Anyone can start. Romans 12, 1 to 4. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. Next, uh, Thomas. Pastor. I do five hundred straight, Pastor. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Thomas. So it, it is with Christ's body, Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we will all belong to each other. In His grace, God has given us a different gifts for doing certain things well. So, if God has given you the ability to pros prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership, ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Dave? Nine to twelve, is it? 9 to 12, please. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourself. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual favor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, uh, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Karen, 13 to 16. All right, Siddharth, 13 to 16, please. Yes, sir. Uh, share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with, uh, with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Thank you. Last one, uh, 17, oh, sorry, 
17 to 21. Prince or Conan, whoever has. So I'm ready. Repay no, repay no one ever for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. It is, uh, if it is possible, as much as depends on you. Live peacefully with all men. Beloved, do not embank yourself, but rather give place to what? For it is written, Vengeance in mind, I will repay, said the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. Uh, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will have colors of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah, thank you. All right. So let's start uh, uh, looking at uh, these verses. We go back to verse one. And uh, we will, you know, try to draw some uh, insights from these scriptures, although these are, like we said, are very familiar to many of us. So Paul begins now, verse 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. So now he's turning his attention to the brethren, to God's people, the Jews and basically the believers there at Rome. He said, okay, I'm beseeching you. That means I'm imploring you. I'm making you the solemn request or this earnest request. I beseech you, uh, brethren. And notice he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren. You know, so therefore means, look, whatever I've told you now, chapters 9, 10, 11, you know, in view of all of that, what is it? That means you've understood what God is doing. You understood God's plan. You understood, you know, God, the severity and the goodness of God. So he mentions that, you know, in, in, in Romans eleven twenty two, he says, you know, think about the goodness and the severity of God. Meaning God is good, but he's also severe. He's good and compassionate, but he's also, you know, God of truth and justice. And so in his dealings with his people, there is this coming together of the goodness and the severity of God. So uh, he says, you know, I, I want you to keep all of this in mind, the way God has worked with the people of Israel, the way, you know, uh, he's, he's okay. He, for a moment, he's given them up to their own blindness, to their own ways, but now he's extended goodness to the Gentiles. So in view of all of this, I beseech you, brethren, keeping God's goodness and severity in mind. Here's what I want you to do. Right. So now he's turning his attention to us uh, to, to the believers and he's saying i'm doing this very compassionately by the mercies of god so what i'm requesting you i'm doing it with a heart of compassion with the with god given mercies by the mercies of god what must we do he says present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service so present your bodies. Romans chapter 8, we're talking a lot about the body. Right? It's talking about, look, you've got to keep the body in subjection by the Holy Spirit. You put to end the sinful deeds of your body, you will live. Romans 8, 13. So he's talking, you know, he's talking about the body. Now he's continuing that same thought. He says, what must we do? Right? So... Basically, this connects back there to Romans 8. We've seen that, uh, you know, Jesus finished the work on the cross. He broke the power of sin. Romans 8, the Holy Spirit is at work in us to um, help us overcome the flesh. So when we walk in the Spirit, we will not yield to the flesh. So in view of all of that, what must we do? Now we must present our bodies as a living sacrifice. So we present, now we make this deliberate choice saying, God, I am deliberately, intentionally and willingly making my body as a living sacrifice. And that's very interesting because um, in the Old Testament, and uh, they, they brought sacrifices, 
right, to worship as part of their worship, they brought sacrifices, animal sacrifices, birds, uh, offering, grain. Uh, they brought sacrifices. But now he's telling, offer yourself. And uh, so it's not about putting another animal there or putting another bird there or, or putting some grain there. Offer your body as a sacrifice. So in that same, so they understand, you know, sacrifice being part of our worship. So he's saying, you know, you offer your body, but your body is not a one-time sacrifice. It's a living sacrifice. That means it's my body, our, our, our bodies are alive. And yet they are sacrificed, they are killed. So it's a living sacrifice. Our bodies are alive. Of course, we need our bodies to be alive, to be on this earth and do whatever God's called us to do. So our bodies are alive. It's a living thing. But yet it's, it's a sacrificed thing. It's a thing that has been offered on the altar. So our bodies are a living sacrifice. They are already, they're permanently on the altar, permanent sacrifice. Uh, but yet we're alive. Yeah, we're we, 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 we doing all these things. So he says, you offer your body as a living sacrifice. And this uh, uh, sacrifice, holy, uh, holy, acceptable to God, holy, pleasing to God. So our bodies are presented to God. How? by keeping them holy and pleasing. How do we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice? By keeping our bodies holy and pleasing to God. So when we do that, constantly, it's, it's an ongoing thing. Like we said, every day, you're keeping your body as holy as something that's been set apart for God and something that's pleasing to God, that is our living sacrifice. And he says, this is your reasonable service or this is your log, you know, um, it actually means rational, logical. It's your thoughtful worship. So it's an act of worship, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice by keeping our bodies holy and pleasing to God. It is an act of worship and it is an act of thoughtful, reasonable meaning there's thought that has gone into this, or you know, you can also translate it as rational. It's uh, reasonable. Let me look at it here. Yeah, um, yeah. The passion translation says it becomes your genuine, genuine expression, or uh, some versions say it becomes your intelligent. Uh, it, it is your intelligent, the same word reasonable is translated as um, intelligent form of worship, right? So that means it's not, so, you know, let's contrast it to something irrational. An ir irrational thing is you're doing it even if it's not logical. Okay, so let's think about this. And I, I don't mean to sound demeaning, but I want us to think about this. Suppose I just go and, uh, you know, I, I just beat myself, uh, you know, with the whips. And I say, that's my act of worship. Uh, if you look at it logically, you'll say, well, what does beating yourself with, and you know, 
tearing up your own skin and bleeding and uh, what is that you know how is that going to help in your worship of god or you know that, that like this you can pick up many other quote unquote acts of worship which does not seem intelligent it doesn't seem rational so in contrast to those irrational forms of worship things that you know don't don't make sense at all paul is saying look you keep your body holy pleasing to god and this is thoughtful intelligent worship to god and you present your body as a living sacrifice like we said earlier meaning it's alive but yet it's on the altar it's sacrificed it's offered to god how by you and me keeping our body holy and pleasing that means the things that are done in this body the things that take place in this body have to be holy and pleasing to god and when we do that it is our act of worship to god so now we know we worship god through song we worship god through uh our giving we worship god through you know other ways where we show our devotion and this is also one of the ways we worship god by just keeping our body holy and pleasing so you can imagine this even if we are you know walking down the street and you make a choice what other choice may be to keep your body holy and pleasing that moment you have offered up worship to god you know maybe walking down a busy street you know and there's some billboard or something that's that's uh, has you know images and graphics on it that are just not something that you and i should set our minds on and so you take your eyes off of it what are you doing you're saying this body and my eyes are a part of my body this body is going to be holy pleasing to god at that moment in that busy street i've offered up thought felt intelligent worship to god why because i've may i that moment i have offered my body as a living sacrifice i have worshiped god right there so paul is saying in view of the mercy so in view of you know all that we've heard about god brethren offer your body as a living sacrifice keep it holy keep it well pleasing and every time you do that you're offering to god intelligent thoughtfelt worship verse 2 and so meaning plus and is a plus continuing and also and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of god so do not be conformed to this world don't pattern yourself don't pattern your behavior don't pattern your thinking and your behavior or don't pattern your lifestyle so do not be conformed that means do not get into the same mold do not come into the same pattern of thinking behaving living pattern do not be conformed to the world the ways of the world 
but be transformed. So we know that word transformed is the word metamorpho, which is, uh, we understand in English, metamorphosis. That, uh, and, 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 and the best example of metamorphosis is how a little wiggly caterpillar becomes this beautiful butterfly. So you look at the caterpillar, nothing impressive about its tiny little thing, uh, wiggly like a worm. And uh, then it undergoes metamorphosis. That means it, it has such a change, such a transformation, that little wiggly worm becomes this beautiful flying butterfly. So that's, that's the word here, be transformed, undergo such a metamorphosis in what? In the way you think, the way you behave, the way you live. That means instead of getting into the pattern of this world, thinking and living and behaving according to the world, have a transformation, a supernatural change in the way you think, the way you behave, the way you live. So be transformed, be metamorphosized. So he's saying, believers, I want all of you to be transformed. Be metamorphosized. That means don't be like the caterpillar, but just how the caterpillar has this dramatic and drastic change. You have that dramatic and drastic change in the way you think and live. And then he tells us how this is possible. He says, by the renewing of your mind. By the renewing of your mind. Now, while this is not Paul's intent here necessarily, maybe we don't know, he just used the word metamorpho in the Greek, um, whether he was actually thinking intently, whether the Holy Spirit was giving him this thought about, you know, this butterf caterpillar becoming butterfly, or that I, I don't know whether that was there. Maybe it was, maybe it was, and we don't know. But just for our understanding, you see, when the caterpillar reaches the stage where it knows, or it reaches it where it, it's going to start this process of metamorphosis, the first thing this caterpillar does is begins to eat, uh, eat, I, I don't know what to, <laughs> to use the word, it just keeps eating consuming leaves so it gets on this on this uh, you know on whichever plant it is and it keeps eating 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 all the green leaves you know, it just consumes and you can you're surprised that this little little worm starts eating so much eating the green leaves around it you know or whichever bush or tree or plant it's on eats and 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 then of course it expands, becomes a little bigger, but it eats so much because it's preparing for a change that's going to take place. And then it disappears into this cocoon-like thing. And then inside that, all the changes are taking place. And then the next thing you know, out comes a metamorphosized creature, the butterfly. But I would like to compare this eating stage, consuming is to you and me, consuming the word of God. Because it says here, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, what is this renewing of the mind or renovating of the mind, the renovation of the mind? The mind we know is our 
has to do with our mental faculties. It has to do with the way we think, uh, uh, the way we reason. So what Paul is saying is, of course, it's by the Holy Spirit. So what God is telling us is, don't conform yourself to the world. Have a transformation in your way of life. And this is possible if you will renew your mind, your thinking. And uh, the best way for, uh, you know, for, that I find to explain what renewing of the mind is, is in Isaiah 55. Uh, if we can go there to Isaiah 55, and let's please read verses 7 to 9. Could somebody read that for us? Isaiah 55, 7 to 9, please. Somebody could read that. Okay. Uh, let the wicked forsake their ways, and the earth unrises their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon them. Yeah, eight was eight to nine. Eight to nine. Uh, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Okay, thank you. So, this I, I feel this is like this is the best example of what renewing the mind is. In verse 7, God is speaking to the wicked, right? So, Isaiah 55, 7 through 9, speaking to the wicked. That means a man who is, let's say, the world, right? So we're talking about not being conformed to the world, but being transformed, having complete transformation through the renewing of our mind. So speaking to the wicked, a man of the world, and he says, I want you to forsake your way and your thoughts. Forsake means let go. Let go and turn away from it. What? Your ways, your thoughts. And he says, verse 7, let him come to the Lord. So you let go of your ways and thoughts and come to God. And God says, I will pardon you. That means I will receive you. And then verse 8 and 9. God says, I want you to know something. My thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not your ways. And my thoughts and my ways are much higher. And then verse 10, I mean, verse 9, they are so high. That's like as, you know, as the heavens are above the earth, that's how high. That's, there's a big difference between the ways and thoughts of the wicked and the ways and thoughts of God. It's, it's like, Huge difference. And God is telling the wicked, you forsake your ways and thoughts. You come to me, I'll receive you. The implication here is, I'm going to help you take on my ways and my thoughts. And this is going to happen, verse 10 and 11, by the word of God. And we didn't read verse 10 and 11, but God says, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. The word of God is going to help us take on the ways and thoughts of God. So, what is the renewing of the mind? The renewing of the mind is this process here that we read in Isaiah 55, 7 through 11. It is me letting go of my ways and my thoughts and taking on the ways and thoughts of God. And as I take on the ways and thoughts of God, I'm going to undergo a metamorphosis, a transformation. I will no longer be conformed to the ways of the world, which is wickedness, but I'm gonna be you know, beginning to walk on the higher levels, on the higher ways, uh, the higher level which God is in, 
in the ways and the thoughts of God. I will be transformed by the renewing of my mind. So we renew our mind with the word of God. That means we train ourselves to, to leave the ways and thoughts of the world the way we were used to and to take on the ways and thoughts of God through the word of God. And right here in chapter 12 are some of the ways and thoughts of God given to us. Right, so we talk about forgiving, we talk about showing love, so on and so forth. But we learn to take on the ways and thoughts of God. And as we do that, our minds are renewed. Our minds are renewed. So we go through like the caterpillar eating, 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 eating those leaves. We have to consume, 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 consume the word of God. And as we consume that word, that word begins to renew our ways and thoughts. Make them new, make them different. Right? We begin to think. We begin to consider ways that are aligned to the ways of God and thoughts that are aligned to the thoughts of God. Okay? So, that process we call as the renewing of the mind. So the renewing of the mind results in this. It results in transformation of our lives. So when we renew our minds, transformation takes place. We're able to think differently. We're able to, uh, oh, sorry, as we renew our mind, we are able to live differently. Maybe see we have experienced a transformation in the way we live. So let me pause here. Was that clear? Uh, did you did we understand that? Is everything okay? Okay. Yeah, I see a response on the chat. So, how can somebody experience renewing of the mind? We have to, like the caterpillar, we have to keep consuming the word, the word, keep consuming it. You know, keep eating the word, keep eating the word, keep eating the word, keep eating the word. So people will think, like, what is this guy just chewing on the word, eating, eating, eating the word? <laughs> well, it's like what the caterpillar is doing, right? Uh, it seems like crazy. Why is the caterpillar eating all these leaves, feeding on, feeding on, feeding? Why is the caterpillar doing this? Well, it's getting ready for a transformation. In the same way, we keep eating the word, keep eating the word, keep, you know, uh, feeding on the word. Why? Because you're learning the ways and thoughts of God. We are learning, we, we have forsaken our own ways, we have forsaken our own thoughts. So now we need something. What is that? the ways and thoughts of God by his word. We're taking on the ways and thoughts of God and, and our mind is being renewed. And as our mind is being renewed, our life, our behavior, our thinking is transformed. So we are no longer conformed to the world, but we are transformed to live according to the ways and thoughts of God. So for example, like in the same chapter in Roman, Romans 12, he says, towards the end, he says, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now that's, that's the way and thought of God. The world's, way, the world's ways and thoughts are, I will repay evil for evil. Somebody does bad to me, I will do maybe twice as much bad to them. That's the way of the world. 
So if we consider why is there so much escalation and evil? Because everybody is trying to outdo or repay twice as much evil as they received. So somebody does so much evil to me, hey, I will do twice as much back to them. Oh, if they do twice as much, I will do more. So there's an escalation of evil because that's the way and the thought of the world. Evil for evil. But the way and thought of God is this. Don't repay evil for evil. Instead. And don't be overcome by evil. That means somebody does evil to you don't let that dominate you. Instead, overcome evil with good. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. Overcome evil with good. He's done bad to you, you do good to him. That is the way and thought of God. Now, that is not our natural response. Meaning, uh, as conformed to the world, that's not how we would respond. But when we renew our mind with the word of God, and say, hey, what are the ways and thoughts of God? The ways and thoughts of God are, don't be overcome by evil. Somebody does evil to you. Don't let that control you. Instead, overcome evil with good. Do something good in return. Now, initially that will be really difficult. Oh, how am I going to do good when that person is you know, being mean to me? Well, as we feed upon the word, our mind is renewed. Now we are able to behave differently. We have been transformed in our way of living and our way of thinking. So even when somebody does evil to us, we return good. Right? So that's what he's saying. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Now, that phrase, the renewing of our mind, is right in the middle of this verse. And he says, look, this renewing of our mind brings about transformation in our life, but also helps us some, with something else. The verse continues. That you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It says, when you and I renew our mind, we can prove. The word prove is interesting because it's like we can test and determine through our testing. It's almost like a, you know, a, a lab, a laboratory procedure. Now, I'm not saying that's exactly what they they did in those days, but I'm just using uh, a, a, an analogy today. It's like in the lab, they test some, you know, they get some samples, they test it, that is, they are proving it, and then they come to a conclusion, yeah, this is genuine, this is wrong, false, true, whatever. So he says, when our mind is renewed, when our mind is renewed, you can prove you can test and you will know the will of God. You will know the good, acceptable and perfect will of God. So the renewing of our mind not only helps us see transformation in our living, the renewing of our mind also helps us in the determination of the will of God. So when there are things happening around me and, you know, I have this thing, that all those things are happening around me, I will be able to, you know, test. I will be able to prove. I will be able to, if, if I want to use a different word, I will be able to analyze. And that's okay. This is the way, this is what God wants us to do. So here's another key. Many Christians, many believers they say, I don't know the will of God. Why you don't know the will of God? Because when you and I renew our minds, 
we will be able to prove the will of God. You'll be able to analyze and say, this is the will of God. Now, he uses three adjectives, good, acceptable, and perfect. Now, traditionally, you know, people have used these three adjectives to say that there are three levels in the will of God. There is what is good, there is what is acceptable, and that's what's perfect. But I feel that interpretation and that teaching is wrong because he's just using three adjectives to talk about the same thing. That means God's will is always good, acceptable, and perfect. So he's not saying there are three categories of the will of God. He's just using three adjectives for the will of God. Just like how he used uh, holy and acceptable to God. He's, you know, so if you're holy, you're acceptable. The word acceptable simply means pleasing. Like he, in verse one, we just read, holy, acceptable, pleasing. That same word acceptable is used once again in verse two, same word. Now, we don't say holy is one category, pleasing to God or acceptable to God is a different level of holiness. We don't say that. We just say, he just means, or verse one, if you're holy, you're also pleasing or acceptable to God. So that's how he's using it, right? So in verse two, he says that you may prove that you can analyze and know through your analysis, through your thinking process, through your thought process, you can know the will of God and what is good, acceptable, and perfect. That means what is the best thing? There's no... There's, the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. He's not talking about three categories of the will. See, this is the will of God. God's will is good. God's will is pleasing. God's will is perfect. So what is, you know, the thing that is really fitting in to the will of God? Okay. The same word acceptable is used somewhere else, you know, for example, in Colossians, and it's translated pleasing to the Lord, to be pleasing to the Lord. So, when your mind is renewed through your own thinking, you can recognize this is the will of God. This is what's good and acceptable and pleasing to God through your own way of thinking. Because your mind has been trained to know the ways and thoughts of God. So, through your own thought, the way you think, you will you will be able to say, this is good, this is acceptable, this is pleasing to God, this is the way to do it, this is the will of God. So that's another benefit of renewing the mind. When we take on the ways and thoughts of God, through our own thinking, we will know the will of God. This is what God wants you to do. Right? I don't have to wait for some the clouds in the sky to part, or I don't have to wait for an angel to appear. I don't necessarily need a dream or a vision or a prophecy. Why? Because when your mind is renewed, you can prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Now, I'm not. I'm not saying we shouldn't have dreams or we shouldn't have visions or uh, we shouldn't have angels appearing. I'm just saying that. This is the normal way by which all of us can know the will of God. Just renew our minds to the, to the word of God, to the ways and thoughts of God. And then in every situation, you're able to prove that when you're putting all the information together, you'll understand, you know, you know the ways and thoughts of God. So you're able to say, this is good, acceptable, and pleasing to God. This is the will of God. Any questions? We'll pause for a break and uh, any questions? Okay, okay. All right, so let's just take a quick 10 minute break and uh, we will come back together. Thank you. <laughs> 